Uh, the past few weeks have been pretty interesting in regards to the Boko Haram movement. Essentially, longtime leader Abu Bakr Shako has had his status challenged more or less in an unprecedented fashion, resulting in some back and forth messaging uh, that has brought a number of key internal issues within the movement out into the open. Uh, just to briefly recap some of the main developments as both uh, uh, factions have been on a bit of a media blitz recently. Uh, to start on August 3rd, uh, Al Naba, which is a weekly newsletter of the Islamic State published in Arabic, held an interview with uh, one Abu Musab Al Bernawi. Now, in this interview, it referred to Al Bernawi as the Wali or governor of Wilayat Garb Afrikia, uh, also known as the West Africa province, which we more commonly refer to as Boko Haram. Now this came as a surprise. No reference was made to Shako or his status at all, nor any sort of overt discussion as to a leadership change that had occurred. Uh, as for Abu Mustab al Barnawi himself, he'd previously surfaced in a January 2015 video uh, where he was given the title of spokesman of the group, but never really appeared in any media productions following that. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, while the Al Naba newsletter did not mention this, uh, sources close to Boko Haram later revealed that Al Barnawi is actually the son of uh, Boko Haram founder Muhammad Yusuf, so giving him a bit of legitimacy in his own right. Now, Shiko responded within hours with a uh, short audio statement, essentially rejecting his demotion. Uh, this was the first we had heard from him in months, and the fact that he was able to respond so quickly diminished some of the speculation regarding his status and lack of verified media appearances in recent times. Al Barnawi's faction came back with a bit of a rambling audio <coughs> statement a few days later, uh, which accused Shako of a litany of deficiencies uh, and claimed the support of a few other major Boko Haram members. And one key actor here is Mama Noor, an important figure I'll discuss a bit more uh, shortly. Uh, Shiko then uh, surfaced in a video, and this was his first video appearance since February 2015. We have a screenshot of it here, of him standing in a lush green background uh, surrounded by two fighters. Uh, essentially, Shiko reiterated his stance, uh, rejecting Albernawi's leadership. Um, and the video also featured about two dozen armed men uh, voicing their support for Chico and rejecting Al Bernari as well. Over the weekend, then another uh, video from Chico's faction emerged, and this one featured about the four dozen of the more than 200 missing uh, Chibok schoolgirls dating from that infamous kidnapping incident back in April 2014. Now, this video didn't include Chico himself, but an unidentified speaker uh, called for the release of uh, all detained Boko Haram members in return for the freedom of these girls. Uh, then finally, uh, just two days ago, there was another short video from Al Barnawi's media wing uh, that surfaced and, and kind of took us through uh, one of their more recent attacks, uh, but pertinently did not mention anything specific on the leadership rift or uh, Shiko or anything of that sort. So at any rate, all this back and forth messaging uh, has ensued over the span of the past few weeks and revealed a serious fracture within the organization. Uh, essentially at this point, two movements have more or less broken apart and with the Islamic State coming down in favor of al Banawi. Now the differences that have led to this split are both rooted in uh, sort of ideas about the implementation of the struggle and more personalized concerns regarding Shiko's leadership. Uh, so some of the main points of contention, uh, perhaps the biggest issue revolves around the definition of who is a Muslim and what acts cause a Muslim to lose the religious status and thus allow them to be targeted. Uh, it's a pretty important issue, so I'll take a few minutes here to go over the arguments from both sides. Um, and essentially, Shiko has argued that those who are not active in their opposition to non-Islamic institutions lose their status as Muslims. For example, 
In his view, one cannot live in a society commonly with non-Muslims, nor live under an administration that is ruled by anything but Sharia law and not actively challenge those structures. He also noted that those who fled areas under his control, uh, essentially meaning IDPs and refugees, uh, fall in the same category. In this sense, the definition of who is a Muslim is closely tied to one's actions and requires uh, an individual to sort of be proactive to kind of prove their religious status. On a practical level, this means that uh, ordinary Muslim civilians in the area who attempt to go about their daily lives and have not necessarily actively supported this movement are not considered true believers. And this sort of, um, uh, sort of ideological take has paved the way for this wave of attacks on markets, uh, bus stations, mosques, IDP camps, uh, and so forth, other sorts of uh, civilian soft targeting that we've seen over the past few years. Now, Al-Barnawi and his faction differ here and take a bit of a softer stance. Uh, essentially, they're arguing that unless someone has taken part in an overt conspiracy against Islam, uh, they retain their Muslim status. Uh, so in essence, it's a sort of innocent until proven guilty approach. And this is what forms al bernawis and his faction's opposition to these attacks that have resulted in high civilian casualties, uh, many of which are Muslim. Um, and this has also uh, been a long-standing kind of issue within the movement that's, that's boiling out now. The Islamic State appears to have sided with al bernawi in this aspect. And I think that's apparent if you go back and look through the Islamic State's messaging about Boko Haram activities. Now, since admission into the Caliphate in March 2015, Islamic State media operative, operatives have selected approximately 18 different Boko Haram attacks to highlight and promote to uh, their audiences. Now, none of these 18 have claimed to target Muslim civilians nor even uh, mention the use of the female suicide bombers, for that matter, focused on that sort of issue. So I think it's a glaring omission uh, by Islamic State propagandists and likely reflects some core thinking within the Islamic State itself. So that's kind of a big, uh, more implementation ideological difference between the two factions. Uh, but al Barnawi and his group have had another of other uh, specific complaints about Chico's leadership that precipitated the move. These have included uh, Chico's killing of his own fighters and commanders, often on a whim. In the long audio message, uh, al Barnawi's faction named a few specific Boko Haram members that Chico has had killed, uh, demonstrating further emphasis that his disregard of Muslim life can extend even to his own followers. Uh, often they said these killings were reportedly done in secret and with Chico even lying about uh, the real reason of them. And a few of the, the members uh, in al Bernawi's faction or, or sp who spoke in that clip had also mentioned how Chico had declared them wanted, uh, causing them to, to flee. Uh, al Bernawi's faction also complains that Chico has brought reports about looting uh, during the period of Boko Haram's territorial control, but really didn't do anything about it. And so this sort of calls into question his his uh, interest in installing, installing uh, adequate governance in areas under his control. They also stated that he routinely ignores his sure counsel, rushes into verdicts, makes up his own Quranic interpretations. Uh, and this also sort of calls into question his, his judgment as leader and his capacity in that regard. But perhaps just important as the concerns over Chico's dictatorial tendencies, the al Bernawi faction also essentially lays the blame for the downturn in Boko Haram's war over the past year and a half at the feet of Chico. Um, Boko Haram's lost the vast majority of its territorial control and uh, has really experienced a shrunken attack radius over the past year and especially the past six months. And they complained that Chico didn't do enough for his fighters, uh, that, he, that the fighters went hungry while he lived well. And in addition, that he was responsible for uh, a series of logistical issues which hindered the movement's capabilities, citing, for example, of lack of fuel and, and weapons to their members. 
So it's these uh, key issues that led the al-Barnawi movement to split under the support of the Islamic State. Uh, the divide over the status of Muslims is perhaps the most prominent, uh, but concerns about Chico's leadership and the inability to turn the tide of the war were likely other important supporting factors that led al-Barnawi and his movement to act uh, now. So what, all is it, what does all this mean going forward? While much remains uncertain, there are a few points we can make. Uh, first of all, challenges to Chicot's leadership have existed before, but none have been as credible as this. Uh, Al Bernawi seemingly enjoys the external support of the Islamic State and carries significant weight in his own right as the reported son of founder Muhammad Yusuf and in his previous capacity as group spokesman. Furthermore, he has the claimed support of key figures such as Mama Noor. Now, Mama Noor was reportedly number three in uh, the Boko Haram movement at the time of the 2009 uprising after Muhammad Yusuf and Shiko, and reportedly even took over uh, leadership for a while while Shiko recovered from a gunshot wound. He has experienced training in Somalia, and upon his return to Nigeria was viewed as the mastermind of that attack at the United Nation headquarters in Abuja back in 2001. So Noor carries significant uh, weight within the Nigerian jihadist community and his throwing his support behind uh, Barnawi uh, also uh, adds a bit more legitimacy to this, to this faction. Uh, secondly, there may be a sort of Ansaru element in the Barnawi faction some of the messaging that has come out is very similar to what Ansaru was saying a few years ago and reflects long-standing concerns regarding uh, Shiko's leadership, the, the killing of fellow members, and, and particularly attacks against Muslim civilians. Uh, remember, Ansaru uh, first publicly made themselves apparent in uh, early 2012 after a widespread assault in Kano that killed many Muslim civilians, an attack that uh, they were very upset with. So it's possible that some members who reintegrated with Boko Haram, which is, which is a popular theory explaining Ansaru's operational disappearance after uh, early in 2013, could be behind uh, Barnawi's faction or joined up in some regard. And if so, this would be kind of an interesting point, given that the Ansaru movement was traditionally uh, closer to uh, Al-Qaeda, and in particular Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, and Banawi in his, in his uh, audio statement mentioned how some of his fighters have trained in uh, the Sahara, in the Sahel. Uh, so it would be interesting that now that they would be looking for, towards the Islamic State for support and legitimacy. Um, violence between the two factions is possible, given Chico's reported history of not taking too kindly to challenges. Now, this never overtly materialized outright with Ansaru, but uh, at the same time, Ansaru also broke off rather than directly challenging Shiko for his position. Now, both sides have warned to avoid each other, uh, but promised a violent outcome if not. We should be cognizant of some issues that, that might uh, temper this uh, in terms of capabilities of both groups and the distances between them. Uh, with the al Barnawi faction fleeing the Shiko area. And so uh, isolation could, could uh, uh, weather this sort of storm a bit. Uh, but this also ties into what role the Islamic State could play. Now, Shiko has professed his continued loyalty to Ab Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in both of his statements uh, since uh, hearing about al Barnawi's sort of assumption in his position. Uh, so it's, it's not been a complete break yet at this point. Nonetheless, he's been overt about using the old name for his group, uh, Jama'atu al-Sunnah al-Dawati wal-Jihad, uh, while stating that his, his uh, take on this sort of ideological uh, stance on the targeting of uh, Muslim civilians is deeply rooted in that group's history and a part of their ideology. Uh, but it's, it's the, at this point a little bit short of a complete break. So it's possible the Islamic State could be able to step in to, to mediate between the factions. And one um, sort of requirement of admission into the Islamic State is sort of a unity within the command structures. And this was uh, a rumor of what was going on in, in the period of negotiation with Boko Haram in the Islamic State. 
So it's possible that this sort of element could uh, occur again. Uh, having said that, if violence between the two groups does occur, uh, it would be it would make sense for the Islamic State to to step in in support of their candidate. Now it's unclear exactly what role this could take, especially as the Islamic State actors uh, nearby in Libya are currently under a state of siege and being pushed uh, from their capital in Sirte. And thus far, little operational support has really materialized to the Boko Haram movement from the Islamic State anyway. Uh, but I think it's something to watch going forward uh, to see if this sort of rift might pave the way for an increased role uh, for the Islamic State in the Lake Chad Basin region. Now, we don't know too much about the size or status of each faction, uh, and the back and forth messaging is likely aimed in part at convincing some uh, other units within the movement to choose sides. Uh, Shiko is reportedly in Sambisa Forest, while Al Barnawi is closer to Lake Chad. Uh, from both videos, though, it looks like they could be formidable actors. Shiko's faction is holding or uh, hostage at least 40 to 50 of these uh, schoolgirls, indi indicating some sort of logistical capabilities. While the attack video that came out from Al Barnawi's side showed off some impressive military hardware. One area we could see uh, a shift is in future attack trends. Now, that's not to say this would necessarily result in more violence, but perhaps a different sort of violence. Um, Al Barnawi has basically argued, why are we focused on asymmetrical attacks against Muslim civilians when we could be attacking churches and the military? In his Al Nuba interview, he came out very strong against the spread of Christianity in Africa, stating something to the fact that we will try to blow up every church we can find. Uh, church targeting has largely fallen off in the Boko Haram movement over the past few years, but it used to be a significant part of what they do, and any resumption would likely be linked to Al Barnawi's faction. Direct engagements of security personnel are also uh, more linked to what he's arguing. We've seen some of these recently, uh, most pertinently in Basso in southern Niger in early June, where militants were able to push uh, joint Nigerian-Nigerian forces from a base in the area and, and essentially take over control of the city for a few days. Now, this more closely adheres to Albanari's sort of attack profile and the messaging coming out of his wing, uh, highlighting the Basso attack, but also a few other similar attacks could indicate this sort of future template uh, for violence. On the other hand, Shiko has also definitely threatened the military. I reiterated that threat and threats to the Nigerian government in his message. But he remains steadfast in his belief that this sort of civilian soft targeting that has been going on is permissible. Uh, so that would indicate that the continued assaults on IDP communities, mosques, uh, markets, bus stations, sort of in uh, indiscriminate village targeting would likely signal the work of Shiko's men. Uh, so I think it'll be interesting to watch some future attack trends in this regard and that might give us a better idea of where each each group, each faction is operating. Yeah, so the Boko Haram movement has uh, generally initially relied heavily on on uh, Kanuri recruitment, but, but I think it's a pretty interesting point that they never really define themselves as a Kanuri movement, and their messaging overtly was always done in Hausa, uh, perhaps with a few Kanuri statements here and there, but a very, very strong uh, element on, on speaking Hausa um, before later on, on shifts to Arabic, but to appeal to a wider audience. And there are plenty of instances of recruitment outside the Kanuri um, uh, sort of element. Um, and so I think they've always defined themselves more religious uh, in, in, in that sort of background rather than ethnic, even though uh, their initial base happened to be heavily uh, Kanuri. Now, does that play into this sort of split at all? Um, locationally, uh, geographically, if we're looking at where we think each actor is, uh, and with uh, Al Barnawi's faction closer to Lake Chad area, and with a lot of rumors of recruitment from the uh, Buduma factions, uh, the Buduma ethnic group up there, and with Shiko more in the Sambisa area and uh, an area of more traditional Kanuri influence, uh, we could see recruitment patterns uh, going in that way. 
Um, but I'm not sure there's there would be any sort of specific uh, Kanuri element in this split. Um, we don't know uh, Albanawi's uh, ethnicity, but a uh, few of the people are coming from Borno State. There's likely that there's Kanuri's in his sort of movement as well. Um, the issues you talk about Kanuri favoritism and, and some previous claims that Kanuri's weren't chosen for suicide bombers and whatnot. Uh, those were things we were hearing back in 2012. Uh, 2013 and haven't heard as much uh, 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 more recently. Um, so so I, I don't know if I can put too much uh, um, stock in, in sort of uh, an ethnic element to this point, at least based on, on what we know. Just to go back to kind of the history of uh, civilian targeting in Boko Haram, I think it, I think it's good to look through this. Shiko is saying this has always kind of been our history and whatnot, but it wasn't really uh, happening as widespread, and we didn't see these sort of indiscriminate village attacks until uh, about kind of mid-2013, uh, the 2014 time period. And what happened was Boko Haram was essentially pushed uh, from cities into rural areas, and uh, uh, part of this reason was the rise of civilian vigilante organizations. Now, initially, Boko Haram began attacking the vigilante organizations themselves, then family members and friends of vigilante organizations, then villages that host village vigilante organizations, uh, and it expanded from there to uh, civilians in Borno State uh, at large. So while that has kind of always been what, what uh, Chico's arguing, part of his ideology, there's been a, a dramatic increase in that sort of, of attack and, and, and sort of the acceptability of that over time. Now at the moment when Boko Haram pledged to the Islamic State, these sorts of things were going on. And that's uh, some reason why uh, uh, people surmise there was kind of a long period of, of likely negotiations between the Islamic State and Boko Haram for their admission, and probably why there might have been concerns from, from Al-Qaeda for this sort of group uh, to join their fold. And, and we've seen that previously in Somalia, how it took Al-Shabaab uh, a while to kind of get um, sort of uh, uh, acceptance to be admitted into the Al-Qaeda fold. I think the key thing here is that uh, Shiko seemingly is not really taking direction from the Islamic State on certain things. There was uh, some um, concerns or claims that he he had ignored Islamic State directives to stop using child suicide bombers, for example. Um, the fact that I, in my opinion, that the Islamic State has completely ignored uh, the large scale use of female suicide bombers uh, in in this or their messaging also reveals perhaps some concerns there. So so I think the disagreement kind of revolves on perhaps Shiko not necessarily taking a, a sort of direction. And perhaps um, uh, even though those attacks were happening, there was the thought that those could be uh, reeled in. I think uh, uh, the Basso attack was kind of revealing in this regard. Um, uh, we mentioned that attack before and in southern Niger in early June. Uh, it was kind of a surprising uh, ability of Boko Haram milit militants to, to push uh, security forces from that area and really hold uh, the city for a few days. Uh, and really that's the kind of attack uh, the, the MNJTF should be able to prevent or at least uh, adequately respond to. Now there are kind of an offensive going on in the area a few weeks later, uh, but it was a bit delayed. So I think there's still some issues, obviously in terms of coordination and, and sort of rapid response there. Um, the, the, the units are still clearly viewed by national units. Part of this recent offensive, uh, uh, Nigerian and Chadian forces were coming down and meeting Nigerian forces in northern Nigeria, but the Nigerian forces have reportedly already left uh, Damasak, a town on, on the uh, Nigerian side. So I think there's clearly still some sensitivities about uh, having foreign forces on um, um, uh, soil uh, that's not their own. Uh, and so these sorts of uh, uh, issues persist. And I think that's a key thing going forward for the MNJTF. There's, there's been encouraging signs on the coordination element, but keeping this uh, uh, going is, is a key thing going forward.
Well, again, again, I think uh, uh, capabilities are a key key part of the the, the issue here. Um, we've seen attacks go down in in, in the past, uh, generally suicide attack rates and whatnot, and attack honestly attack uh, radius go down in the past few months. Uh, outside the three northeastern states under state of emergency, uh, Yobe, Borno, and Adamawa, and neighboring areas uh, in Niger, uh, Chad, and Cameroon. There hasn't really been a major incident, um, I think, uh, since late November uh, outside that sort of sort of circle. So uh, attack radius has shrunken. Uh, suicide attacks just over the past few months ha have gone down as well. And on the issue of territory, Boko Haram has lost a lot of that territory that they, they previously controlled um, over the past year uh, based on military efforts. Now, would they sort of increase violence? I mean, I, I think if they could, they, they certainly would. I, I see no reason why they would slow down. Um, again, we're talking two different sort of factions and potentially two different attack uh, profiles. Uh, so looking in uh, Chicot's sort of, uh, sort of uh, capabilities right now, and if they are kind of holed up in Sambisa Forest, if they're suffering under the airstrikes, if the downturn in suicide attacks uh, is due to uh, uh, less explosive materials, less sort of bombers around, uh, less sort of uh, recruits forced or willing. Um, I, I think that kind of shows the situation they're in. So I think we need to look at the realities of, of their capabilities to sort of answer that question. Um, and uh, they'll, they'll do what they can essentially to, to show their position and, and show where they are and show what they can do. Uh, but it's just kind of a matter of, of what really uh, they can do. Uh, there's an ideology here and a worldview that just doesn't uh, uh, sort of mesh with what uh, is possible under with the Nigerian government. Um, and I think some aspects are, are radicalized to the point where negotiation is probably a very difficult sort of uh, outcome. Now, having said that, I, I think there's also elements perhaps that you, you can peel away through, through negotiations or whatnot, especially uh, rank and file members who are perhaps not as committed or perhaps uh, were forced into the organization or whatnot. So I, I wouldn't say uh, that it's impossible to kind of um, uh, go down this track, but if we're talking with the top of leadership and for an end to violence, uh, I think that's a difficult sort of situation really to envision.